So can I give you a little uh, behind the scenes look into how I typically prepare sermons? Oh, thank you, Theo. So generally speaking, I look at the text at the beginning of the week, read it a few times, kind of get familiar with what's happening, with the wording, and then I put it away and I let it marinate. And I find that as it comes to mind throughout the week that the spirit is kind of pulling little pieces from that scripture. Hey kid, can you go sit down please? Thank you. So I find that the spirit will illuminate little bits and pieces of it throughout the week. And I'll kind of know then by Thursday or Friday, typically what the, what the spirit is moving within me, within the text, that there's some kind of connection. Sometimes it's just a single word that stands out and I go, well, I've never noticed that word before, or well, that's a weird phrase. Or what about that person in the story? Um, Lena asked me about the connection between, like, who is the person who got their ear cut off in this story? The, the, the pronouns are not uh, helpful in this. And I said, oh, it's just, it's a servant of the high priest. It's just some guy. It's just some guy who showed up because his boss said he had to, and he got his ear cut off. And like that to me, that, that, that's the sort of thing that would be like, let's look a little bit more into that guy. So I'll tell you, this week, I, uh, I did that thing. I looked at the text. I actually expanded the text to be bigger. And uh, my spirit was unsettled the whole time. Not because nothing popped out, but because everything popped out. Because there were so many things that popped out. Um, throughout this period of, of this series, we have been looking at these pieces of art that depict each and every day of this week. And we've been looking for where we fit in the picture of it. And sometimes it's been easy, sometimes it's been a stretch. But I think we all can resonate at least somewhat with some of the people in these crowds, in these pictures. But this story, this story today has so many different individuals in it who are having very different experiences of the same, uh, the same evening, who's, who are coming here from such different places and who are leaving as such different people that I just, I couldn't focus on one. <laughs> So here's what I want to do with you today. I want to focus on everyone. We're going to do a scatter shot here. We're going to walk through this story of what is happening on this evening that we typically call Maundy Thursday. We're going to look at a bunch of art pieces that depict each and every step along the way. And I want you to pay close attention to whose story resonates within you. Now. That doesn't necessarily mean whose story are you currently living right now? You know, if I say that, you know, Jesus is betrayed by all of his friends and you're like, yeah, my friends are awful too. You don't need to go there. It can connect with something from your deep past, um, perhaps a deep wound or a deep joy or a deep connection somewhere within you that stirs when you hear about that person. Pay attention to that person because I want to talk about that person later, okay? All right, so let's do a little storytelling. On the first day of the week, Jesus goes into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, surrounded by peasants who are screaming, Hosanna, which means save us. They throw palms on the ground, which is what most churches are doing today, and they shout out, uh, come and save us. There's in one of the gospels, uh, some of the, the, the people in charge, they say to Jesus, Hey, can you calm these people down? They're about to cause a riot and Rome does not take too kindly to riots. And Jesus says, Hey, good luck. If you get these people to stop talking, the rocks are going to start shouting out. Jesus is saying there is something in the air right now that you cannot stop and you cannot control. And the harder you push it down, the more it will grow. And so you kind of expect Jesus to then march in and start, uh, go up to the palace and start waging war, but he doesn't do that. He actually just does a little sightseeing and then goes to bed. 
And the next day, Jesus and his friends go to the temple where he finds the normal money changers and merchants in, the, in that vast temple complex. And for some reason or another, decides this is the time for a violent public demonstration. And he knocks over tables. He braids a whip. He's attacking people and sending animals running out into the midst. But as we talked about this week, that was probably a booth or two in a space the equivalency of the parking lot at Walmart, that whole complex not just the Walmart, the whole area on Route 100. And so probably did not have as much of a widespread effect as we sometimes imagine. But it showed this Jesus that was getting his hands dirty, that was angry, that had righteous indignation. We then moved on to a day where now the leaders were wanting to get rid of this guy, but they need to find a way to trap him in his own words, to implicate him so that they have an excuse to send him away. And so they try to use their religion as a weapon to destroy this guy. And it doesn't quite work because he uses the same logic on them and they go, oops, this is kind of silly, isn't it? The following day, Jesus and his disciples are at the home of a likely a very wealthy person, and a woman comes out and she breaks open an alabaster jar worth roughly, in today's money, $50,000, pours it on Jesus and anoints him. And Jesus is honored and blessed and sees the gravity of the situation, but his disciples, and especially Judas Iscariot, is horrified. They say, what a waste, because to them, they're living in the end of time, and they're scared, and they're worried, and nothing seems quite right, and how can we justify such excesses when people are starving all around us? And you know how many people could have eaten today with the money if we had sold that instead of you wasting it on Jesus' head? And Jesus tells his disciples that you are so worried about the lack around you that you can't see the beauty in front of you. Is that okay, Theo? Did it spill? Okay, you're cleaning it up? Wonderful. It's hard to do things with one hand. So then that leads us to Thursday. Thursday where Jesus gathered together in an upper room in a very large house um, that can seat all of those people. And they... Um, he washes their feet, which made them wildly uncomfortable. And then they have a meal together, which is this meal which we celebrate every single time we are together. And after they have finished all of that, Jesus knows his time has come close to an end. And he takes Peter, James, and John, his inner circle of the inner circle, his closest friends, the people that he trusts more than anything else, and he takes them out to a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. It is... Uh, a garden, gardens were places that were usually privately owned. Um, space was at a premium, especially space with arable land. And so um, this was a space that was probably owned by one of the many wealthy women who followed Jesus and kind of bankrolled the whole thing. So he goes out there with his three people and Jesus prays. Jesus prays, Abba, Father, for you are all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Jesus doesn't want to go through with what's going to happen next. And I don't think we talk about that quite enough. Jesus says, God, you can do this without the horrors that are coming. Please reconsider. Just let that sit with you. Jesus doesn't quite know why he has to do this. And he's willing to. He's willing to be obedient, but he doesn't want to. And in other Gospels, we read that he's crying, that he's, that he's got blood dripping down him from his sweat, that he has bursted all these capillaries under his skin. And meanwhile, while he is praying and while he is weeping and while he is so clearly distraught and tears are rolling down his face, the three guys he came with are sleeping. 
They had just recently said, we would cross the longest desert for you, climb the highest mountain, we would take on entire armies in your name, we are with you to the end, but they are somehow not able to do a simple thing. It's easy to do a grand gesture, isn't it? But the little things, the simple things, the simply being present with somebody who is suffering, especially when you're tired and especially when you've had some wine, it's late, it's dark, the crickets are doing that soothing thing that they do. And Jesus is crying, sure, but he's fine. He'll be fine. He's always fine. And drifts away. And three different times he goes and wakes them up and says to them, why can't you just be present with me in my suffering? Why can't you just be here with me? You don't have to do anything. You don't have to fix anything. I just want you to be here with me so I feel less alone. How many of us have claimed that we are willing to do something grand, but then when a little thing comes up, suddenly we find ourselves not as willing? Yeah, Nate, Nate's raising his hand. I'm raising my hand. Yeah. Yup, yup. And if Nicole watches this and she's thinking, yes, one of these days he'll fix the outlets in the bedroom. Yes, yes, I will. That's one of those little things that's hard to do. When, uh, when you imagine that you're capable of big things. So as he's been praying and they've been sleeping for some time, Judas approaches. He approaches with a group, depending on which uh, gospel you read, but a group of people who are from the high priests and the Pharisees and all of them. There's a mob with them. They probably have torches. People have weapons. You can see Jesus has just had enough of this nonsense. You love that face. This is, this is, my, uh, what I, this is my Jim from the office picture of Jesus, where he's looking into the camera going, Really? But Judas, I find to be a fascinating character. Why did he do this thing? Why did he go to the chief priests and tell them the way that they're going to be able to not only arrest him, but what they can arrest him for? Because Jesus has been really careful about what he's been saying to people in public. So he hasn't gone around saying, hey, I'm the son of God, and I'm going to topple human governments. He's been very careful. Judas goes to the chief priest and says, this is what Jesus is saying in private. You can come arrest him. You can do it this night, and I'll show you him right away. Why? John seems to think it was greed. It was all about the money, right? Because he, he was the keeper of the purse and he used to steal. But 30 pieces of silver is basically about $350. So he sold out Jesus for 350 bucks. That's not greed. Nobody would do that for greed. Judas is the only southerner of the group. Did you know this? That everyone else is from the northern country of Galilee. Around, They're mostly fishermen. They live up in the sticks. Judas is from Judea. He's from the south. He's from this area where they've got Jerusalem and the centers of power. He's got a whole different mindset than everyone else. Likely a more revolutionary mindset. Likely somebody who joined up with Jesus because he saw somebody who can finally stick it to the man. There are some folks who believe that he may have been a part of the zealot movement, that he may have been a part of the um, Ishtari. Ugh. There's a violent group at, at that time as well. And he had been on board with Jesus in the turning of the tables, eh, but not so much the other times. When he had the opportunity to take direct action, instead Jesus chose peaceful nonviolence, demonstrations, conversations. He, he hung out with all of these rich women instead of demanding that they give everything up and uh, become poor with him and be radical. So perhaps Judas is uh, a justice-seeking freedom fighter who became disillusioned with Jesus and lost faith in the way of nonviolence who said, yeah, my ideals are such that this is the way that we're going to save our people, but ideals aren't going to make it anymore, Jesus. You are too much of a pie-in-the-sky dreamer. We need action, and we need it now. I can relate to Judas in that way. I don't know about you. A disillusioned, justice-seeking freedom fighter 
who suddenly feels that the high road isn't going to make it anymore and we need to play dirty, we need to play by their rules if we're going to make any progress. I get that. So in all of the commotion of Jesus being arrested, of the crowds coming, of the shouting, it's dark, there's torchlight, Peter suddenly springs up and chops off this poor guy's ear. <laughs> now, if you ask Peter to stay up late and stay with you and, you know, be emotionally available for you, he cannot do that. He will fall asleep. If you ask him to be a big, violent, manly man and stab a guy, he's there for that, right? That to Peter makes a lot of sense. So it's dark. He's had a couple glasses of wine, which is probably why he cuts off a guy's ear because he's just doing this deal, right? He's just kind of flailing around doing the best that he can. But Jesus rebukes him. In the other gospels, it says that Jesus picked up that ear and put it back on. Healed him like a Mr. Potato Head doll. Just stuck it back on. So Peter thinks of himself as the hero of this story. That I imagine while he's doing this, he's imagining single-handedly fending off all of these people like some kind of superhero and saving the day or at least dying in battle while Jesus runs and flees and gets away safe and he can be the hero of this story. He wants to be the hero but in the end, all he can do is just cut off some random guy's ear. <laughs> He's not quite as strong as he thought. And when it was clear what was happening, they all ran away. Every last one of them. When they realized how vulnerable they are, when they realized that Jesus might not win, all their ideals went flying out the window. And they ran for safety. None of them offered to be arrested with him. None of them offered to be arrested in his place. None of them did anything. When Jesus needed his friends the most, he found himself alone. But there's one more person that I want to introduce you to. Somebody that was not in our reading, uh, but somebody that shows up in the next verse after our reading today. A funny little verse that, I don't know, sticks with me and always has. The verse goes like this. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. Don't worry. This is one of the few pictures where it's not totally naked yet. That's a pretty random detail to include in a very important story about Jesus and disciples that Mark is using precious ink to describe some boy who was there too, who got his cloak taken and he ran away naked. It's pretty random to do that unless that's an autobiographical detail, which it most likely is. It's the only detail that, uh, it's the only gospel that includes this detail. And both the uh, Last Supper and the garden scene in Mark are more vivid with more details than any other gospel, which tells us that most likely the person who wrote this gospel was there in that space, who witnessed it, who had it seared into his memory for all time because he's a kid here. My guess is somewhere probably around 10 years old. Um, Mark, um, so yeah, between 10, or 10 to 12 years old, and his mother, Mary, which, very popular name, hard to keep track of all the Marys that follow Jesus, but this is Mary, the mother of Mark. Mary was a wealthy woman who owned her own property, which was not uncommon in those days, but it was her house that became a central point for the early church. It was her house where they had just been having communion in that upper room. It's her house where they hid afterwards in a couple of chapters. So it's in this kid's childhood home that Jesus had just broken bread and poured wine and foretold his own death. Mark, this 10-year-old kid, is probably in the room while all of this is happening. They probably know him by name. Some of them probably have rubbed his head before and they have little cute little nicknames for him that he hates so much because he wants to be grown up like everyone else. 
His adolescent mind, like every other adolescent mind in history, is so full of ideals, naive hopes and dreams for the ways that he and his generation are going to change things and are finally going to make things different. He listened rapturously to Jesus' words and asked his mother to explain who this man was and why he is so important. I wonder why he was in the garden with them. While Jesus was praying with his disciples, do you think he was just like hiding behind a tree watching, trying to figure out what was happening? He was able to stay awake. He's young. He's full of energy. Or did, was he in the house cleaning up supper with his mom and heard Jesus crying and came out to go see what was going on? Or maybe he was in the house or maybe he was just kind of on the periphery and he saw the mob moving up the mountain and ran up there to see if he could help, or at least to see what was happening. Was he there from curiosity or devotion? I don't really know. We don't really know much other than this subtle clue of him being seized by a soldier and man managing to wriggle his way out and run home naked and exposed and embarrassed and confused. Can you remember the first time that you were disappointed by a leader? or an establishment that you thought were unassailable? When you learned that your favorite pastor was really a creep, or you realized how fragile democracy really is? What's going through this young naive mind as he runs past all these gawking onlookers, naked both in body and in soul? So where do you feel drawn not necessarily where are you today, but where can you relate? Where in your story does it touch this story? Where can you connect? Where is your intersection points? Open question. <laughs>